Um, okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Eva Scheller, who's our speaker today. She's currently uh, Heising Simon, uh, what is it? Peg, I don't forget the order, 51 Peg B Fellow at MIT. Uh, before that, she did her uh, PhD and master's at Caltech. And before that, a bachelor's at Copenhagen University. Um, Eva's work involves a lot of different things um, from uh, analysis of orbital and rover data from Mars to uh, laboratory and field work of terrestrial samples. Um, and her research covers a really like broad spectrum of things, um, all sort of like along the theme of understanding the geochemical evolution of terrestrial planets. Um, and that's everything from understanding carbonate formation to understanding the early Earth to understanding the volatile cycle uh, and habitability of early Mars, which is uh, what we'll be hearing about today. Um, and before I give it over to Eva to, to start our talk, a uh, reminder that we'll have a happy hour tonight at the Crown and Anchor at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in chatting more with Eva, please feel free to join us uh, then. Uh, so with that, I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks so much, Tim. Um, yeah, very excited to be here and learn about all the cool things you've been doing. Um, so one thing that I work on, among other things, is the problem of searching for Mars's missing carbonates. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, but we're going to see mostly data from this Perseverance 12 mission that you can see a little picture of there, uh, some of the news results from the past couple of years. So, all right, let's, all right. So as Tim nicely pointed out, a lot of the things that I work on have to do with characterizing habitability of terrestrial planets from a geochemical perspective, largely. And there are many different ways that you can tackle habitability. So I just wanted to introduce um, briefly the main areas that I work in. So one part has been uh, organic compound detection and characterization. We're not gonna have time to talk about that today, unfortunately, but if that is something you're interested in, please do come and talk with me about it. I have spent um, some amount of time working on characterizing past liquid water environments in terms of their geochemistry. But what we're gonna talk about today is um, more of a uh, subfield of habitability, which is how different mineral sequestration processes can affect the volatile cycles of terrestrial planets. In this particular case, it's going to be about carbon sequestration um, although, as I learned today, a lot of you are familiar with my work on water sequestration. Uh, yeah, so just highlighting this is what we will focus on. So before I go into the details of the talk, let's just go for a brief overview of what we'll talk about. So we are going to introduce this um, big Mars carbonate question and what that entails. We're going to talk about the Perseverance rover instruments, how we make these specific measurements that I'll show. And then we will learn some of the results uh, and updates to this carbonate question for the Perseverance World Mission. And um, we will summarize everything and what we learned at the end. All right, so what are we talking about when we're talking about carbon sequestration? So in earth science, um, for those of you who work in geology, but to those of you who may not, um, you may be familiar with something called the geological carbon cycle, which is something we've studied on Earth for a very long time, and we know this has a large effect on how Earth's long-term climate develops over geological times. This is a very simplified way of talking for briefly how it works in essentials. You have some CO2 in the atmosphere. When you form a liquid water system, some of that CO2 is going to be dissolved. You, If you have the right conditions, you're going to form carbonate minerals, uh, which is a way to sequester the CO2 into rocks. If you have some volcanic process that is melting these rocks again, you can release that CO2 in the form of volcanic outgassing. And that's uh, in a simple sense, the general carbon cycle that we study on Earth. So let's take a look at what we know about Mars. So this problem on Mars is not uh, that different, but there are some uh, differences. So the main one is that Mars's atmosphere is predominantly CO2. Uh, rather than the nitrogen atmosphere that we're used to. And we know that there has been probably more CO2 in the Martian atmosphere than there is now, because we have all this great evidence for liquid water presence on ancient Mars. 
and we don't see a lot of liquid water today. We do see a lot of CO2 ice deposits though, that's actually the main reservoir of CO2 on Mars. Um, but again, if you've had this liquid water system and you have a predominantly CO2 atmosphere, you should expect to dissolve some of that CO2 in water and potentially form these carbonate minerals. Um, we also know we've had lots of volcanic rains and volcanic outgassing of CO2, but we know less about sort of the deep carbon cycle of Mars um, than we know about surface processes, just so that's a fact of where we have the most data. It's much more challenging to make measurements at depth in the planet. All right, so if we entertain this liquid water system, um, how can you get these carbonate minerals to form? Uh, so a carbonate mineral is just uh, this CO3 2 minus anion connected with a cation, and this is just a standard salt precipitation. Uh, so carbonate minerals are salt, basically. So on Earth, most commonly, we have a lot of calcium 2 plus available, and that's what's going to form this calcium carbonate. On Mars, the scenario is a little bit different. Um, we have a much more iron-rich planet, so the cations available tend to be iron and magnesium, and we typically form these iron magnesium carbonates instead of calcium carbonate. But any of these um, two plus cations can basically go together with the carbonate anion to form carbonate minerals. So um, let's take a look at sort of why is this a interesting question that people have spent a lot of time thinking about? Well, there is this idea that we've talked about uh, in the introduction that the atmosphere of Mars should have been much bigger in the past to explain this um, warming that was conducive to forming liquid water on the surface. So a big question is, how did we go from a thick atmosphere to this very thin um, 6.4 millibar-ish atmosphere that we see today? And if you really simplify the problem, the two major ways of removing CO2 from this uh, planetary system is either through escape processes and enact on the upper atmosphere, or it's going to through, be through this sequestration process, this geochemical set of reactions that we just looked at. And so way back in the day, back to Viking missions and the first evidence of past liquid water on Mars, people were um, predicting that there should be a global layer of carbonate or big carbonate layer if you consider liquid water presence and a really thick CO2 atmosphere. So the major questions here become how much CO2 can you lose for these escape processes? How much can you lose into this carbonate layer? And you need both of those to eventually back out how much CO2 would have been there in the past, or at least that's one way of thinking of the problem. So we've had a lot of spacecraft instrumentation looking for carbonate because of this particular problem. Um, and as you can see here, we have made some carbonate detections, but certainly not this um, predicted global layer of carbonate. And that is uh, the observation that has given name to the Mars missing carbonates, as some people like to refer to it. And these observations of carbonate come from initially from this Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, satellite instrumentation called CRISEN. And its first discoveries was made in uh, 2008 by, by PhD advisor Bethany Elman. And subsequently, there were more of these spacecraft observations of carbonate, both from this same instrument, but also from some of the landed spacecraft. So let's explore some of the ideas that people have put forward to explain the missing carbonates on Mars. Well, one thing is that if you're trying to observe a mineral from satellite, you need a specific concentration and the right conditions to reach the detection limit simply of the instrument. So if the concentration of carbonate is very low, you may not observe it. However, we know that this cannot just be the case for Mars because we have had very sensitive instrumentation on the Curiosity rover searching for carbonates in a lacustrine, liquid water field system with all kinds of liquid water alteration um, that found very little carbonate presence. So it cannot just be a detection limit issue. Now let's put into a diagram form, just visually, how much these carbonate uh, CO2 reservoirs we're talking about would look like in a bar sense. 
So the present day CO2 reservoir would be equivalent to this red bar. And you know, with various different models and constraints, what people try to constrain for past Mars is something like one or two bars, which is what I have exemplified in yellow here. Now for comparison, this is what the satellite spacecraft observations have recorded is the observed amount of carbonates in the uh, satellite observations. So this is a relatively small proportion in these uh, green bars, which is simplifies the range that has been reported. And the figure green bar, this one, um, has often been cited to be a more extreme scenario of what you could extrapolate from the satellite idea. So to progress on this problem, I'm going to introduce three key areas that I think are important to further think about. One is going to be actually measuring the abundance of carbonates. So how much carbonate is there? Is it actually a small amount um, like we think from satellite? The second is going to be the mechanism of how to form this carbonate. That might yield some understanding of why we're not seeing this global layer of carbonate. Maybe you shouldn't expect that from the, car the mechanism that uh, is forming the carbonate on Mars. And then the third thing we're going to need is the rate of how fast this carbonation occurs, which is eventually, if you want to work on some kind of, um, in a climate sense, in a climate model, atmospheric model, you'll need to understand the rate of this formation environment. All right, so back to our big carbonate picture here. So the Perseverance rover is going to, was going to this specific area where you can see the big rectangle of carbonate observations. Um, so we are predicting we're going to see some carbonates. Um, and so from Tim's great work on this landing site of the Perseverance rover, here's an artist's illustration of sort of what people were imagining was going to be in the Perseverance rover landing site. Um, there's evidence of a river that flowed into this Jesuit crater, forming a ancient lake system and these ancient terrains around the crater. Here is the orbital image of what this landing site looks like today. So we have a uh, schematicized for the non-geologists in the audience. Just what is a river and what is a sedimentary band? Um, for those of you who may not have heard those terms before, so you can see the, the river inlet here and the big fan. And here you can see the traverse of where we've driven. So we started out driving in this part of the crater, which is called the crater floor. And then we drove all the way up through these sedimentary fan materials. We're actually a little bit farther up now than when I took this screenshot. But these are the materials that we're going to talk about today. All right, so before we go to the perseverance instrumentation, how did we know that there was going to be carbonate in this landing site? Um, I have mentioned orbital spectroscopy a few times, and this is the actual orbital data showing the carbonate evidence. So this is an infrared reflectance spectrum. We're looking at one to 2.6 microns, and we're looking at the reflected sunlight off the surface of Mars. And we're tracking specific carbonate absorptions that we can see the satellite data in comparison to the laboratory data here. You can see how they match nicely. And um, the other observation we can make are hydration bands, so water in the presence together with this carbonate. And we can also observe iron absorptions here related to a important iron-bearing mineral called olivine, which we'll get to. A neat thing we can do with this satellite data is we actually obtain a spatial cube of data so we can map out where these absorptions occur. So in green, we mapped out where these carbonate absorptions occur. And in purple, we are mapping out um, some iron magnesium phytosilicates, some other hydrated minerals. And you can see in the, in the green areas here, largely up here, we would have a lot of carbonate absorptions from orbit, uh, also a little bit in the delta as well, but not any carbonate absorptions out here in the crater floor. All right, and here you see the rover traverse from before. Obviously, the big um, smoking gun carbonate area is going to be up here. Uh, we recently just got into this area, but those results are so early that I cannot um, show them today. 
All right, so let's talk about the perseverance rover instruments. So we're going to largely talk about results from these two instruments sitting on the arm of the perseverance rover. One is the Sherlock Raman and Luminescent spectrometer. That's the one that I primarily work on. And that's going to give a Raman data, which we'll see in a moment. It also has a really high resolution camera that produces some very amazing images. Uh, there is a X-ray fluorescence elemental mapper as well, which is called Pixel. And then we will briefly see a result from this SuperCam instrument, which produces a heap of different spectroscopic uh, data sets, but we're going to look at, again, these infrared reflectance data. So let's focus on the primary part of what we're going to see, which is Raman spectroscopy. Now, the Sherlock instrument is a little bit unique in that uh, most Raman spectrometers use a red, green, or near-infrared laser. Sherlock uses the ultraviolet laser, but all of these work with the fundamentally same principle, which is that when you have the laser interact with a molecule, it's going to cause something called Raman scattering, basically scattering the photons of the laser. And we measure the shift in the uh, wavelength position of the scattered photon compared to the laser wavelength position. And that's what we refer to as the Raman shift. That's the property that we're going to see all the data in. All molecules, uh, vibrational modes have specific characteristic Raman shifts that we um, try to identify. Um, just so you can gain a little bit of insight into how do we characterize an instrument to know how it's going to observe uh, on when it's on flight on a mission. We make a lot of measurements in the laboratory. So here is some work that I did uh, with Joseph Ratzel Hollins as the lead and Jasper as one of the collaborators and me as one of the collaborators. I'm characterizing what this uh, Sherlock spectrometer was going to be able to observe in different proposed uh, minerals that we would see in the landing site. So here you can see uh, we're tracking again this Raman shift property that I talked about and just intensity on the y-axis. And for the carbonate mineral here, we're tracking this main primary mode that you can observe a, a nice Raman peak there. All right, uh, another thing that you can do with Raman shift properties is that uh, depending on which cation species, so remember I talked about cations combining with carbonate anions, depending on which cation species you have, um, they're gonna shift the Raman shift a vibrational mode up or down it was predicted from satellite that we would observe magnesium carbonates. And so they would have a pretty high Raman shift, uh, either in an hydrous form or in hydrated form. And um, conversely, if you have a more calcium or iron rich carbonate, they would shift the Raman shift down. And that's actually something that we can constrain with the Sherlock instrument. All right, so I mentioned that this iron bearing silicate called olivine is going to be important. So for the non-geologists, this is iron magnesium silicate. It's typically green. It's very abundant in the mantle. It's a very common crystallization product of magmas. Um, and we can actually characterize that with the Raman spectrometer as well. It has a nice um, descriptive feature right here. And the third mineral we're going to look at is called sulfate. So very similar to carbonate. Uh, this is just a sulfur version of the anion. Um, that we can track. Uh, what's nice about sulfate is that it's typically hydrated and can actually track the um, hydration through OH stretches in Raman spectroscopy. All right, so that was the introduction to the instrumentation. Now we're gonna go and look at the actual results from the Jesuit crater. We're going to start here. So this is where we didn't have any orbital carbonate observations uh, in the crater floor. So for a series of papers that would be too long to show all the evidence, but that I will just recommend you to check out these two papers, um, we characterized what the composition of this uh, Jezero crater floor was, and it turned out to be two igneous rocks. Um, the upper level igneous rock is a basalt. So for the non-geologists, again, this is a very common um, igneous rock that forms crystallizing magma. It is the most common component of Mars's crust, and it's a mineral mixture of many different minerals giving this black texture. And underneath that basalt, we observe this olivine cumulate, 
And this is very a much more exotic rock. Um, basically, we have a rock that is mainly made out of this olivine, this iron magnesium silicate, um, forming an entire rock in itself. And to summarize of different results before showing them, the key observation here was that we had carbonate detected in this olivine cumulus, but not in the basalt materials. And we'll talk about the implications of that. So here's the evidence for how we can detect this carbonate. I introduced these laboratory spectra before, and you can see here what the actual Sherlock spectra looks like on flight. Um, quite a bit more noisy. That's typically how it goes with flight data, but you can still see a nice uh, matching from a peak here matching the carbonate and a nice olive peak here matching the olive. And um, there's a lot of processing that goes into making these kinds of observations that you know we don't usually talk about, but those involve baseline corrections, characterizing the signal to noise, um, making sure you actually have a signal, fitting these signals, and all this laboratory work. And I just want to highlight that because there's a huge team around being able to make those constraints that we don't usually get to talk about all their great work in detail. But those are the many things that go into making these detections. All right, so when we operate this uh, Sherlock spectrometer, we can operate it in a grid structure. So a way to visualize our data is in this color-coded form. Each of these circles represent a spectrum similar to what we just saw. So each of these is a full spectrum like in the black. And I've just color coded what the model interpretation of that spectrum ends up giving. So in blue, we have these carbonate peaks. In green, we have the olivine peaks. We have some um, silicates and some phosphate as well, which we're not gonna talk too much about today. But the really key observation here is the uh, massive amount of olivine, some of the evidence behind this uh, olivine cumulate. Um, we also have the observation of the carbonate, sometimes in a mixture with this olivine. Sometimes there are areas of uh, olivine with no carbonate present, and sometimes a little bit of um, carbonate existing alone as well. This grid operation is really important for trying to characterize a geological material or even a geological process uh, in the robot chain. Now, going back to this Raman shift diagram that we were looking at before, one of the interesting discoveries we made were that these carbonates are non-magnesium carbonates. So these are actually uh, relatively iron-rich carbonates. You can see that their Raman shift position promises this uh, full Raman shift range, basically representing the what we call the solid solution of iron and magnesium carbonate mixtures. All right, so then I'm going to introduce this third mineral, the sulfate here, where you can see our laboratory spectrum from before, and then what the Sherlock data looks like in comparison, giving quite a nice match. And here is another image of this same olivine cumulate rock. We can see some of the olivine, but here we have zoomed into the what we call the alteration phases, the phases that have reacted with water in the rock. Um, we have a sulfate sort of crystal in the middle and then the carbonate in the surrounding. And then you can see there's a lot of open circles. Those denote materials that the Sherlock instrument cannot observe. And that is includes a lot of important alteration silicates. So what can we do to solve this issue? I mentioned that we have another spectrometer, which is an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. It also sits on the arm of the rover, but it poses an interesting problem because these spectrometers observe the same material from different geometries. And so they will obtain material uh, observations from the same material, but matching them together is not always so easy. So what I've been working on in the past uh, year or so is how to um, transform these data sets into being used in conjunction. So I'm introducing just a schematic showing how can you do this? Well, you can take the camera images of these data sets you can perform a correlation algorithm, basically finding matching spots and having a warping algorithm solve the geometric problem for you such that you can get a nice match. Here is the result of one of these um, transformed images that I produce. And let's look at the result from this particular area. Now we can nicely fill in some of the missing information from the Raman spectrometer. 
we see uh, here the different colors will correspond to different um, oxide equivalent elements. That's a way that geochemists give elemental data, but it's basically tracking silicon, sulfur, iron, and magnesium. The hydrated sulfate is matching nicely with the sulfur. The carbonate is tracked by this iron and magnesium, the aluminum as well. But this uh, missing material is a silicate that you observe here. And in the diffraction pattern from these uh, X-ray fluorescence data, it tends to look more amorphous than crystalline. Another evidence that we have of this um, silicate material is from the infrared spectrometer SuperCam. Uh, here we're looking very similar to the orbital data set from before, uh, looking at reflected infrared light from 0.5 to 2.6 microns. So excuse me, both visible and infrared light. And we can observe the hydration feature here and a magnesium OH feature as well, really far to be related to this um, silicate that is magnesium containing. You can also see the iron absorption here from the big uh, aluminum detection. Interestingly, if you look at the basalt in comparison, it is not nearly as hydrated or affected by um, liquid water reactions. Okay, so in a simple sense, how can you, what's a model for how to form this carbonate in the olivine cumulate rock? So um, olivine is known to be really great for carbon sequestration. It's one of the first materials that people think about to solve any carbon sequestration problem. If you expose olivine to a little bit of dissolved CO2 in water, you are going to dissolve the olivine, you're going to release exactly these iron 2 plus and magnesium 2 plus you need for the carbonate. You will precipitate out your carbonate at the right conditions, and you're going to be left with silicate. Um, that silicate is going to react with the water in a series of hundreds of different possible reactions. I summarize that in a very simple form here, but you know it can be clay forming reactions, it can be serpentinizing reactions, but this is a common way to form carbonate and hydrogen silicate in conjunction. So let's run through some of the important principles of olivine dissolution that um, causes it to be such a great carbonation environment. Well, we've already touched on this iron and magnesium two plus liberation. There is another component which has to do with dissolution rates. So we tend to show the solution rates uh, here on the y-axis as a dependent on pH. That's just a common way to show it. If you look at the dissolution rates of olivine, they're quite a bit higher than these minerals shown in black. Um, so for the non-geologists, these are the common minerals that you find in basalt. They're some of the main components, and they dissolve much slower than olivine. Another component is that this is a, a, a reaction diagram for earth conditions. In anoxic conditions, this is going to be even more increased, it has been shown that olivine dissolution is, especially iron-rich olivine dissolution is much faster at anoxic conditions, which is typically what we have on Mars. Now, um, aside from being able to liberate the right cations very easily, um, forming a very reactive substrate, there's another important component to why dissolution rates is important for carbonate specifically. So the pH evolution of these fluids is extremely important for carbonates because carbonate anion presence is dependent on pH largely. So if you have a low pH, your dissolved CO2 is going to be in the state of carbonic acid. In the middle, you're going to have bicarbonate. And um, really at higher pHs is when you get lots of carbonate anion. That's why oftentimes if you have alkaline lakes at pH 10, you're going to get a ton of carbonate. And so if you have faster dissolution, you typically are able to evolve alkaline fluids or high pH fluids faster. And that's something we observe in many earth environments. So typically many, many reasons to put alien dissolution to be great for carbon sequestration. So let's summarize these um, environments from the crater floor specifically. We observe this alien cumulate with carbonation in it. Uh, there was some sulfate as well. When we look at the basalt, it doesn't have any carbonate, but it does sometimes have these um, sulfates that we observed. And so these are just the first results from the Brahmin spectrometer um, that is summarized in this little science report here. 
with a very big team behind this instrument and just showing you know what was the very first things that we observed on the surface of Mars, um, including all this stuff we just looked at. All right, so fast forward one year in the mission program, we get to the sedimentary plan. This was a very coveted topic. Um, Tim has obviously played a great role in um, moving this as, as one of the important key uh, observations in Mars science. Um, the hope was to find these uh, fine grain sedimentary deposits that may be really good at preserving organic compounds. Um, well, we did find some of those, but the ones that we're going to focus on are the carbonate-bearing ones that were a little bit surprising. Again, this is not an area where we had lots of carbonate absorptions from orbit. Uh, okay, so we found this fluvial coarse sandstone. Here you can see what a beautiful color image that is generated by one of my collaborators on the team, Sonanda. And um, she's able to merge different camera images to get these high-resolution color images. And you can see the individual sand grains here uh, going from several millimeter to several millimeter in size. Now, um, let's look at the chemical results. So here is one of these compilation products that we're going to produce in, where we can see the Raman spectra in compilation with the X-ray fluorescence results. And you can see we observe a lot of carbonate in the Raman spectra. Again, each of these blue points is a spectrum like we saw before. And the iron in the X-ray fluorescence maps is largely following this iron carbonate that we observe. Um, you can also see more uh, silicate-rich areas. Those tend to be the silicate grains that are present in this uh, fluvial sandstone. But the really key observation was we had upwards of 28% carbonate in this uh, fluvial sandstone that we did not necessarily anticipate that we were going to have. Uh, again, looking at the Raman positions of uh, the carbonate, we again observe that these are not magnesium carbonates, but these mixtures of iron and magnesium carbonates that are um, typical of, again, olivine dissolution with these mixed cation environments. So how can you get carbonate in a sandstone? Um, there are a few ways, but this is the most typical process for how to do that. Um, again, you need to have a fluid with the salt CO2, iron 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus is what we observe in the carbonate. You need some way of um, reaching saturation in the fluid. Now, the most common way to do that is through evaporation or just having a lot of dissolved material and very little fluid. And you can get easily get this iron magnesium carbonate to precipitate out. That is something that very commonly occurs when you have olivine in the watershed of your fluid because you get this right mixture of the iron two plus and the magnesium two plus, and you have lots of olivine bedrock um, thought to be similar to this crater floor material in the watershed of this river. All right, so let's put everything together. Um, we have a model of the crater floor from before. This is what we observed in the delta. Um, we have these, uh, these layers of this carbonate sandstone we just looked at. We have another type of sandstone, which is more fine grain that has lots of sulfate, 58% sulfate instead of carbonate that alternates and beds with this carbonate sandstone. We're not going to talk too much about that, but it's an interesting observation that this sulfate sometimes form when the carbonate doesn't. All right. Okay, so let's get back to our original um, question. What does this mean? What does all these perseverance observations of carbonate mean for our big picture question of carbonation systems and laws of atmosphere on Mars. So I um, want to first um, update, what did we learn about these three areas that I find key to this question? Well, one thing that we um, got from our observations is an actual abundance of carbon. So we observed that there is three to 20 weight percent carbonate in our rocks. We see the three to 10 weight percent in the igneous olivine cumulus, and we see upwards of 20 weight percent in this fluvial sandstone uh, with water derived from an olivine rock uh, watershed. Um, and this was actually found in areas where we didn't observe any carbonate absorptions from upper data. Taken at face value, that actually means that depending on the outcrop exposure and conditions, you may not observe um, a lot of carbonate with this satellite. So there's a constraint there on the detection of this satellite. 
Um, mechanistically, we found, this is to me the most important, we found and confirmed a way that carbonate forms on Mars, which is driven by this olivine dissolution kinetics and olivine weathering. Before uh, landing, we had all sorts of hypotheses for how the carbonate would form that I worked on for a long time. And so this was a great accomplishment that we could actually nail down that it is this olivine weathering process that is enacting. Again, we have this carbon precipitation or precipitation from a fluvial fluid. But again, that is a fluid derived from the olive uh, watershed. Um, in terms of rate, you know, now what we can do when we have these abundances and we have the uh, mechanistic understanding, we can go and recreate these conditions in the laboratory to constrain the rate of carbon information in such reactions. And that is something that we're working on at MIT right now. So no results to show, but to tell you how, you know, you build up this kind of understanding from the mission data. All right, so just to go back again and really cement this, um, did we learn something about satellite detection limits? We did, but I would also say this is not the entire story. There is something to do with these olivine ultramafic terrains driving the carbonate um, sequestration that actually would suggest you should not expect a global layer of carbonate if that is a driving process. If you look at the surface of Mars, these olivine terrains make up about 1% of the surface area of the crust. We don't have as much knowledge about the vertical extent, okay, but this is a very small amount of the crust, whereas these basalts are 99% dominating the crust. And through these pretty well-known geochemical uh, constraints, we know we're going to get much faster dissolution. We're going to get this uh, iron and magnesium cation release, the fast development of alkaline fluids in the olivine terrains, much slower dissolution and mixed cation release, uh, slower development of these alkaline fluids. Now, these kinetics are exacerbated if the water activity level is lower, okay? So we may be able to get some constraints on that as well. But in general, it's not um, surprising to find that ultramafic terrains are driving the carbonation on Mars. So let's look at a global map of where do these olivine terrains occur on Mars. So I told you 1% uh, actually comes from diagrams like these, where we're looking at the orbital um, detection of these olivine absorptions, very similar to, to what we saw in the spectrum from before. And they do occur, our, um, our little area around Jezero is up here, but largely in these uh, orange, red, and yellow terrains, we see very similar orbital absorptions as well. Now, there has been new detections of carbonate with this uh, chrism spectrometer on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, since this uh, these early results we saw in the other carbonate map, uh, I've actually gone in and done an analysis of all of these detections, and they there are real detections um, largely occurring in this uh, olivine terrain. And so we're in the midst of proving that this is a global correlation that we observe. Um, and you can kind of get the sense from the overlay of these two maps here. So to close the loop on this, you know, now we know a weight percentage of carbonate in this type of rock on Mars. We uh, have some idea of how large these olivine terrains are in terms of aerial extent. We have to make some assumption about the vertical extent, which we don't have any measurements of. But you can make a simple calculation of how much CO two you expect to be stored in these olivine terrain reservoirs following these principles. And so, a little estimate is you can very easily get hundreds of millibars of CO two stored in this sort of one percent of the ultramafic crust on Mars. Um, and let's take a look at um, just some different scenarios that you can play around with in terms of order of magnitude estimates. Now, if you're assuming um, the 1% of this crust is only one kilometer thick, using a similar range of um, carbonate uh, weight percentages, like we see in the perseverance rocks, you would end up with something equivalent to these uh, blue bars here. Now, this is, you know, this is multiple hundreds of millibar. This is about 50 millibar. Um, now we have evidence that there is aqueous reactions or hydration reactions happening down to several kilometers of crust from other data sets, not necessarily carbonation. So if you were to assume 
the carbonation is occurring in a similar extent, um, you can reach higher volumes of sequestered CO2 here, upwards of um, 0 0.8 bars, which is maybe more of an extreme scenario. But in each of these um, bars, you kind of get a sense that some um, important amount of sequestered CO2 is very reasonable to expect in these ultramafic terrains on Mars. All right, so just for comparison, these are the um, satellite observed carbonate that has been reported from these uh, initial sets of observations. All right, so we've reached the synthesis and conclusion stage. So to summarize, we were able to observe 30 to 28 percent of carbonate um, that was detected where the orbiter actually did not detect carbonate, and that was a little bit surprising to the team to observe so much carbonate. Um, we were also able to observe that these are not magnesium carbonates, these are iron magnesium carbonates. We observed them to be forming in two different environments. One was this olivine uh, igneous, cumulate igneous rock that had experienced some weathering reactions forming carbonate. And the other was this fluvial sandstone where uh, we have some kind of iron magnesium carbonate precipitation. And um, the observation of this geochemical link between olivine and carbonate may lead us to reevaluate a little bit how large the crustal carbonate sink is when we consider the global set of observations that I just showed you, sort of the next steps to this project that I'm working on right now. Um, so yeah, that was my little summary of the, the talk and I'm um, happy to take any questions. Um, this is super cool. So just like the fact that you have these carbonates forming approximately to the sulfate layers, but not in the same layers. So like, what is that telling you about, I guess, the environment that these are forming in? Do you think maybe you have alternating like more acidic conditions or drier conditions between where you're forming these? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It's actually what, you know, pretty much a large part of the team is working on right now. Um, I don't work on this particular question because I work mainly on just the importance of the carbonation to the CO2 atmosphere. So I don't care as much about this <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it is a really interesting question for people work on, especially because sometimes we have the conditions where um, you can find the sulfate together in the carbonated rock, but it's typically just like we saw, well, we too much to go back, but it's typically thought as a later product than the carbonated cells because it's forming these um, isolated pockets of material rather than being an extensive alteration phase throughout the rock. Um, that's how we observe it in the igneous rocks, it's these kind of small pockets. And so in the paper that I was suggesting and in some of the other papers, we're suggesting this is sort of a minor, much later sulfate forming fluid. Um, interestingly, we observed it together with sodium perchlorate, which we talk about in the paper. Um, sodium perchlorate is um, ClO4. So this is a kind of a weird mineral, but it's very common on Mars. It's, every single mission has uh, found the sodium perchlorate. The, the cool thing about sodium perchlorate is that it's extremely soluble. So if you're forming sulfate with sodium perchlorate, um, that material has not seen any water since. So that's a general interpretation. These sulfates are very late in the igneous rocks after the carbonation. And um, in the delta, it's a little bit of a different scenario. And I would say we've been <laughs> breaking our heads and not really understanding this system. These are definitely alternating beds where you see the coarse fluvial uh, sandstone with the carbonate, and then you see a shift to a completely different sediment. I'm hoping I may have some, maybe I have a picture of this sediment. Um, this fine grained sandstone with about 50 weight percent of sulfate. Unfortunately, I do not have this in this presentation. Okay. Um, so the idea is that there must be some alteration in the episodes of the fluvial chemistry in some way. Um, the thing we don't know much about sulfate is that in this entire area, there's been no orbital detection of sulfate at all. <laughs> so we don't know what are the driving watershed material, but most likely there has to be some kind of uh, 
sulfate material outside the crater that is uh, controlling this sulfate, very, very heavily sulfate um, rich fluid. Uh, some of the sulfate is much later diagenetic stages, but most of it is not actually. Um, yeah, so sulfate is very pervasive. In a way, it's very interesting. Some of these results um, mirror very similar to the Curiosity rubber data. They are actually very similar. So this seems to be a very um, dominant control on the fluvial or not fluvial gate resistance on uh, Mars. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the way the the observation of carbonates where there weren't orbital identifications is really, really interesting. Um, is your intuition when you get to the, the region where there are orbital identifications of carbonate, is your or would you speculate that it's an uh, abundance question yeah. or is something fundamentally different about the exposure of the unit that leads to like that makes it amenable to like chrism identification? Yeah, great question. So I will spoil a little bit um <laughs> the numerous results that came back. Um so they are but Brian was right. So there are um, hydrated magnesium carbonates in the marginal unit. They're not all hydrated magnesium carbonates, but there are some uh, really strong detection ones that are miscaconite. Um, so it's the type of carbonate, it seems, that has been driving that detection, uh, at least for the marginal units. We'll have to it, see. The okay. abundance is about the same? It's just... Abundance is about similar. I would okay. say the abundance is higher in the marginal units, um, unsurprisingly. But there's 20% still... is high already. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. 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 So some of the areas, again, we look in very small. Sometimes we're targeting small pockets, right? So we don't necessarily get bulk compositions, but just in that area, you can have the whole um, like 50 weight percent carbonate in the marginal unit. Uh, but it's also a tight question. These, these um, hydrated, you know, Bionis suggestion was that the hydration is controlling the depth of the absorption. And that seems to be correct. Hmm. So, um, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, do you feel like this changes, like, how we should go about the search for, like, missing carbonates on Mars in terms of looking in regions that are, like, more ultramafic? Um, for like siderite carbonate? That is definitely what I would do <laughs> if I was looking for carbonate. Yes. So, um, yep. Great question. So, you know, if you follow my model, that's what you should do. And well, it turned out to be correct in this instance anyway. <laughs> I have a quick question. So if you look at the alteration of alternative rock, mm -hmm. in the virtual rock, usually carbonate um form some sort of vein following the ruins mm -hmm. channel yeah but your observation shows that the carbonate kind of feeling in the you know the small pores yeah the automatic rock. i kind of understand you know for sedimentary carbonate they have very high porosity and if they have fluid flow it's basically carbonate formation will fuel the pore but for automatic rocks your porosity are much, much lower. Mm -hmm. um, that's the reason you look for tertial rock to see the veins of carbonate. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts on that? Like what, why the carbonate alteration on Mars and automatic rocks so different from tertial rocks? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's something that we thought about because um, before we even landed, I was actually studying uh, magnesium carbonate veins that's what we thought we were going to find, these big um, stock work veins that we see in opiolite systems uh, that are controlled by the factor system, um, percolation of fluid. But I will say that when you're looking in lisbonites or serpentinites, um, it is common to find the carbonate as part of the serpentinite matrix as well. It's just that the prominence of these giant magnesium carbonate veins gets more attention, right? They're... Um, much easier way to concentrate the carbonate. Um, I think what we're observing is just very similar to general serpentinites, just subtract the serpentine, which we're not observing, where we see a little bit of this dissolution. I mean, they could even be um, coatings or some kind of zone, uh, but it's part of the general matrix of the rock and just not enough fluid um, to form these big stock works that we are um, used to on earth uh i would suggest it's a water level activity um basically much more water availability in the earth systems than on mars as we see 
a lot of the olivine is intact. This is very uncommon for serpentinizing systems on Earth, right? Um, you know, it, basically uh, most of the rock is not altered. So it's a much lower water activity. So that's what I think we're seeing. Um, I would suspect when the samples come back and we get that um, micron scale resolution that they're coatings or something like that. Um, I have a question from online. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for the really cool talk. Sorry if you mentioned this in the presentation, but what is the significance of having the magnesium iron carbonates versus magnesium carbonates in terms of regional geology formation processes? Oh, regional geology. Um, so to me, I think there's many ways that you could think about this. To me, the iron carbonates has to do with the dissolution kinetics. So. Uh, anything that is more iron rich in these anoxic environments, especially iron two plus, is going to have a faster um, dissolution and a faster reaction, basically. So to me, it's important for the, the um, reactivity of the system. It would be a more reactive system with the iron two plus introduced. Um, magnesium carbonates has a bunch of stability problems, basically, that we then now don't really need to solve for parse. Um, that's a geochemical way of thinking about it. Um, I think this question may be coming because in the watershed area and the online person should feel free to interject, the watershed area of this Jesser crater has been um, introduced to be a magnesium carbonate rich olivine rock also. So I those absorptions that we observe in the, um, the watershed area, I think are going to most likely turn out to be iron magnesium carbonates as well. I think that's maybe what the question is trying to ask. Yeah. Says so thanks. <laughs> yeah. So the next online question, if we have time, my understanding is that most of the olivine-rich Martian meteorites, SNCs, do not have carbonate. How does that fit in with this story? Difference in age, depth, provenance, etc. Are all the orbital detections of olivine carbonate in highlands terrain? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the all the olivine terrain jets, they're all in southern highlands, and they're obviously, um, you know, exposed under surface. The olivine rich meteorites that we have, like Turkertides, you know, someone will have to remind me about meteorite names, but they're typically from the far to be more like interior components of the Martian system. Um, so I would assume it has something to do with exposure to uh, liquid water, like. At surface versus depth. Um, we do have some carbonate observations in, oh, there's also the age component actually. That might be yeah. important too. So we have carbonate observations in all the ancient meteorites from Mars's crust. So these include actually also basaltic breccia and uh, peroxinites. We just uh, don't have any of these surface olivine terrains from the ancient Martian crust. I would, well, I think they're going to have carbonate if we did have them as a meteorite. So we do see this carbonate as a pretty pervasive um, formation of crust. So age and then how deep the material was from, I think, are the two factors controlling the composition they are. I have a simple question. So there's these enormous ranges and water volumes that people have estimated one way or another, global driven layers, you know, hundreds of millions to kilometers of water. Mm -hmm. How much of the two bars of your atmosphere could you dissolve just in the water, given the range of possible water volumes? Yeah, so that's a good question. Can they solve it, right? Yeah, it's it's so it's the next question that we're gonna work on. So I don't have an answer for you, but you can work on these um if you work on these kind of reactions uh, and carbonate formation conditions and you try to constrain the exact reactions and conditions of formation, this is a common way to try to back out paleo CO2 pressures um, and can form a constraint on that given you know some span in simulation scenarios. Uh, so that's the next thing we're going to do is try to put some constraints on that question, but unfortunately I don't have an answer right now. All right. My name is Don. I'm looking over. Um, any more questions? No. Okay. All right. Thank you.